Hey guys, Rational Big Boy here. Recently, a new video has gone viral talking about the way YouTubers criticize movies, especially the focus usually put on minor plot holes instead of more important focal points of the story. From the second I saw this video, I knew it was a bunch of phony trash, and today I'm here to take a break from my 7 hour long Ryan Johnson exposed video to give you a point by point rundown of exactly why this skinny fat soy boy is so wrong. Point 1. Just look at his stupid hat. I certainly can't imagine I'd go outside wearing a dumb hat like that one, and the fact he thinks that's an okay thing to do seriously makes him look like an idiot. Point 2. A suit in the summertime? Let's be honest, this is completely unrealistic and it totally took me out of his criticism video. It also seems slightly ill-fitting at the breast. What's the deal with that? Point three. You call that a beard? In the 2004 stoner comedy Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle, there's a scene in which our meddlesome druggy boys get into some hijinks, stealing some ID badges from a local hospital to try and attain some medical marijuana. Uh oh! They get confused for actual doctors, and are quickly forced into an operating room and forced to perform surgery on a gunshot wound patient. The movie in this scene indulges in a medical myth anyone in the field is likely well aware of. The idea that, when dealing with a gunshot wound, the primary goal is to remove the bullet and after that you're basically in the clear. Regularly in fiction, the simple removal of the bullet will immediately lead to the patient stabilizing, and in Harold and Kumar's case, a team of surgeons even start cheering at the occasion. Of course in reality, the removal of the bullet is the least of the patient's concerns, and actually the bullet is even left in the patient a lot of the time just because it's more risky to try and get it pulled out. Removing a bullet doesn't magically repair all the ruptures that come with a tiny metal object piercing through your body. Now, in YouTube critical nomenclature, this is what many people call a plot hole. In other words, a detail in the plot which breaks from our current understanding of the setting or the story. Harold and Kumar is supposed to be set in a rough approximation of our real modern world. It's not a fantasy or an alternate universe. Yet here, not only is the medical procedure completely off, impersonating a surgeon is suddenly ludicrously easy, apparently you can prescribe medical marijuana as an anesthetic to a gunshot wound, and remove bullets magically repair damaged organs. Yet, we can ignore all these things. After all, it's a comedy, conforming perfectly with reality isn't necessarily the intention of the film and the jokes all work despite the incongruity. It's like an action movie where someone just sort of shields themselves from a grenade and then it's completely fine. It's a break from reality that can be ignored. This kind of thing was the focus of the recent video by YouTuber Patrick Willems, Shut Up About Plot Holes, in which he explains an issue he's had with one of the most popular forms of online media criticism. As he puts it, plot hole style discussions in movies, in which viewers overanalyze what might be called minor logic gaps or inconsistencies rather than the real focus of the narrative, has become a pervasive and damaging form of discussion online. Again, there's that Harold and Kumar example, and Patrick goes on to list a few others, like how Buzz in the first Toy Story freezes when Andy shows up just like all the other toys, despite genuinely believing he's not a toy. Or how Holdo withholds potentially useful information from Poe Dameron in The Last Jedi. Now, I'll ignore that the latter isn't really a plot hole, since it's entirely consistent with Holdo's distrust of Poe handling sensitive information. Okay, I didn't actually ignore it, I just now explicitly mentioned it. Sorry. Anyway, other than stuff like that, I do very broadly agree with what Patrick is getting at. With the proliferation of channels like CinemaSins and the myriad listicle sites currently pumping out top 10 different things Thanos could have wished for articles, it does feel very limiting to see people go so hard on these nitpicky narrative criticisms instead of talking about larger ideas. How the theme of the film plays out, its presentation, its aesthetics, the performances, and the emotional resonance. However, while I agree with the core of what he's discussing... Okay, yeah, I'm totally going to talk about nitpicky details in his plot hole video. It serves a purpose though, and I hope I don't seem dismissive of either side as I go into my particular perspective here. Again, my position is that I agree with Patrick on the broad points, but completely disagree in the details of his argument. It also goes without saying that if you want to fully understand what's being discussed here, please make sure you watch his video first if you haven't already. I've left a link in the description, it's a pretty fun vid. Without further ado, here's my key counterpoints. 
So I could very well be being super dense here, but one thing that confused me about Patrick's video was how he chose to define plot hole, or namely what he defines as not a plot hole. Because among other things, Patrick lists things like characters doing things you wouldn't do and contrived story elements. Then for the following 7 minutes he goes on to describe instances of characters doing things you wouldn't do and contrived plot elements and calling them plot holes, and using them as examples why we shouldn't focus so much on plot holes. To sum up, we're told a collection of things that apparently aren't plot holes, but it turns out they are what Patrick himself considers plot holes. I could see this just being Patrick saying, these aren't actually plot holes, but these are what most people consider plot holes, so when I say plot holes, I just mean what people consider plot holes, and oh god, the term plot holes is already losing all meaning. Anyway, this is a roundabout way of me saying I will be trying to base my examples of plot holes on Patrick's, but there's very well a chance for there to be some miscommunication. Patrick, I'm sorry if I straw man you buddy. So in one instance, Patrick brings up the idea of plot hole criticisms based on characters acting in kind of illogical or irrational ways, like the classic, oh we're in danger, we better split up the group and deliberately make ourselves more vulnerable. Patrick's defense of this connects directly with his main idea that we need to be looking closer at the real focus of the material. Namely, that by insisting we criticize surface details like illogical actions or contrived developments, we're missing more important aspects that are trying to be conveyed. Maybe the creator is trying to demonstrate the ways humans isolate themselves even when it's counterproductive. Maybe Fred just wanted to get his dick wet, man. Daphne and I will go this way. However, Patrick frames this with a clip from the show Community in which characters humorously demonstrate what it would be like if, in a horror movie, characters acted in a rational and believable manner, concluding that the problem is it would be really, really boring. As a writer, I couldn't really disagree more with this point, and seeing how many commenters were parroting this under the video made me particularly concerned. See, a few recent watches of mine popped into my head when I heard this criticism. One film, The Thing, in which a team of Antarctic researchers see their base infiltrated by an alien parasite. Uh, another, The Tunnel, about a TV news crew investigating a series of long abandoned tunnels in Sydney. It follows about a young woman's attempt to deal with a demonic stalker, and finally You're Next, a horror movie about a sudden and mysterious home invasion. All four of these films demonstrate characters who do, for the most part, act in fairly logical, point-by-point -point ways in response to a threat. In fact, on multiple occasions, characters will explicitly call out the typically irrational actions of victims in horror movies. It brings us back to this room, we can scan the whole area. Okay, so we split up and we'll move back here, yeah? No, we stick together. In some cases, characters come up with inventive and reliable ways to deal with the threat once they understand the rules of what they're up against. The Thing has Kurt Russell devising a surprisingly effective blood boiling system to tell crewmen from alien doppelgangers. And It Follows gives us moments like these in which we see a man's house covered in various tells to distinguish an intruding demon, boarded up windows, rattling cans held up by string, and it's haunting because it's a thought process we understand and can associate deeply with. We all have to sleep. How do you do so knowing something is always coming after you? And then there's your next, which I really don't want to spoil, but let's just say it also very much benefits from characters choosing decidedly not to act in that typical irrational way. Now obviously you can argue that maybe in all these cases these details are the focus of the film, uh, especially with something like your next, maybe breaking from those typical contrivances weren't just neat things they added, but the purpose of the text itself. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is the ways that those details can deeply enrich a film. You can feel so much more a part of the experience when characters are acting in a way you recognize, and events are occurring in a way you feel they organically could. It makes it, among other things, way more goddamn scary when a character does exactly what you would do and still ends up in a bad situation. As opposed to when someone's like, ah, oh, fuck this, I'm gonna go piss alone in the woods, and it's like, yeah, of course you died, stupid, you went out for a piss alone in the woods. Why would I care that some silly piss boy gets got? See, the tricky thing with the way Patrick decided to delineate his argument is that he puts this very hard line between what he calls a surface detail and a real meaningful quality to a story. Like, that the way alien blood works in Alien is a surface detail, but something like character motivations in Batman vs Superman are crucial to the story. Mostly, it seems like Patrick's main way of distinguishing here is that the important stuff is core to the text, like understanding why a character feels the way they do, while these surface details are usually more metatextual. 
that it's a bit cliche, that it's unlikely to happen, that it isn't how it worked in previous titles. It's bad more so because of how it relates to either the real world or other media, not the actual story. While there are these somewhat open and shut examples, a blurred line does exist, and even more worryingly, sometimes it is in the surface details that the stuff really worth thinking about in a narrative come to the fore. I just mentioned cliches, but not a crucial derivative of that. Stereotype. See, a stereotypical portrayal of a group in a film is rarely, if ever, the point. Particularly in older films, but yes, still to this day, you'll get the odd character who acts like this weird caricature of a social group, or an LGBTQ person, or a person of colour, or whatever else. They're unrealistic and a bit contrived, and a sort of like human equivalence to that if you take the bullet out of the wound, suddenly the victim is okay myth. They're playing more off of common misconceptions about a group, rather than an observable reality. Nigel, that's great. Oh, great, it's smashing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Perverted or predatory gay character, thuggish black character, wacky Chinese man. Again, I could be wrong, but to me it seems like, by Patrick's own metric, to criticise these portrayals would be to, as he calls it, watch the movie wrong. Because, ultimately, these usually are surface details in the film. They're secondary or comic relief roles. They're only bad in reference to the real world. They're not the point of the film. Somehow I doubt Patrick would claim I was wrong to call out something like this as a worthwhile criticism. In 30 seconds, I got to call the police! Working only within the filmmaker's intentions, working only within the reality of the film itself, totally bars us from wider social or contextual criticisms of the film. The God's Not Dead series of Christian propaganda movies are a great example of this. As YouTuber Big Joel points out in his fantastic videos on the subject, these are films filmed with a host of caricatured and stereotypical portrayals of various groups, and implicitly, or explicitly, reinforce a host of potentially harmful ideas. Like, basically all devout Christians in the movie are portrayed as reasonable and moral people. By contrast, atheists get played as nothing but a bunch of immoral, abrasive dickheads. Other religious groups also get put in a bad light, like the sole Muslim representation in the series who winds up being a PSA for domestic violence. To which you might say, oh, Stop nitpicking about how contrived or unrealistic it is. Can't you just analyse the film on its own merits? I mean, hey, is it really beyond disbelief that a Muslim family is abusive or an atheist is an arsehole? It could happen, and you shouldn't just poke holes in the characters because they're not acting how you would. I don't want to seem like I'm engaging in bad faith criticism here, sincerely, and none of this is me saying that this is what Patrick believes. Hell, the best possible outcome of this nitpick is that Patrick responds to clarify what I may very well have misunderstood. All I can say is that if I have misunderstood these arguments, I'm certainly not alone. Many have brought up the same or similar criticisms against Patrick since his video went out, so I'm sure some greater clarification would be a neat thing. And, you know, I thought it'd be novel to structure my criticisms in a succinct, good faith response instead of an aimless fucking five and a half hour wine fest live stream. Edited critique? What's that? So yeah, I don't want this to be too long, these are just what popped into my head and I hope I made some valid points. Too long didn't watch, in stressing the importance of analysing the core focus of a work over the surface details, I think it's key to remember that a lot of the time cliches, stereotypes, misconception and mistruths often lie in these details. And a lot of the time, it is these details that can snowball into reinforcing limited or misinformed perspectives. The minor metatextual details do matter, and plot holes can too. Thanks for watching that. Uh, again, Patrick, if you watch this, I'd love to hear some clarification from your end. I wouldn't have made this video if I didn't think a worthwhile discussion could take place here. You or anyone else can find me over on Twitter at LackingSane. To my patrons, this is a freebie since response videos probably aren't what you signed up for, but in any case, I hope you enjoyed it. I actually have two topics I'm thinking of moving forward with for next week's video. Either a conclusion for my thoughts on eugenic storytelling, coming off of the Sky High video, or I did feel inspired to do a video about how much Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland is garbage. I might do a Twitter poll, so keep an eye out for that one. Other than that, thanks for watching, likes and shares are great, love you all, and stay safe.